First part of this two chapter series on well, it's called Life in Christ. And um, I guess when they wrote the Catechism and they had to come up with titles for chapters, they just arbitrarily decided Life in Christ and they threw all the stuff that didn't fit into the other chapters in this chapter. So my talk is going to be somewhat disjointed. That's also by virtue of the fact that I didn't have the book to prepare it and I had about an hour to do so. Uh, so, as you may have noticed, if you referred to your schedule and you thought this morning when you woke up, hey, this is going to be great, I'm going to go hear Buck talk about life in Christ, <laughs> you're very disappointed now. <laughs> Just wait until you hear this talk. All right. <laughs> See, what I did there is I set the bar very low for myself. <laughs> now I'm going to try to skip over it. Okay, so... Um, when you look at the actual catechism, not this thing, but at the actual catechism, and you look at paragraph 1691, here's what it has to say. And this is a quote from St. Leo the Great. Christian, recognize your dignity, and now that you share in God's own nature, do not return to your former base condition by sinning. Remember who is your head and of whose body you are a member. Never forget that you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the light of the kingdom of God. So... Thus far in your studies in Catholicism, you have studied uh, every portion of the creed, the symbol of faith, and you've studied, uh oh, don't dial my iPad. You have studied um, all the sacraments, and now you've just witnessed yet another sacrament. And um, we've talked about the Holy Mass. And so this is, I guess, the part of the class where we talk about, or where I'm expected to pull all of this together and explain to you why the church teaches all these things and promulgates all these dogmas gives us all these uh, moral guidelines and gives us the sacraments and gives us all the prayers of the church. And the reason basically comes down to this. Man's calling, as you've heard me give a talk before on this, every single person's calling, the universal calling of every person, whether they're priest or laity or religious or what have you, is to be a saint in the world and to be a saint uh, when we die. And the way that God tries to make that happen for us is a process called theosis or divinization. Now, in the Eastern Catholic churches, that's right, Doug. Yeah, anyway. In the Eastern Catholic churches or in the Orthodox church, um, there's a great emphasis on this idea of theosis and divinization. Uh, it's really the whole, I, the, the, every, everything about Christianity comes down to this. There's not a huge emphasis on it under those names in the Latin church or the Roman church, uh, but it still is very important. And the idea is that we are supposed to, in our kind of fumbling way, cooperate with God to such an extent that we become like God ourselves, right? Not in the sense that we're going to usurp his power or become omnipotent or, uh, as some religions believe, eventually get our own planet where we can create our own stuff. No, not like that. Uh, the idea is that we're going to so closely identify ourselves with life of Christ and live lives in Christ, ha-ha, <laughs> brought it all around, and uh, that's going to, that's holiness, right? Living that sort of life, identified with Christ, that's holiness. And that's the way to become a saint. And so the way to think of it is this, right? If you live a really bad life and you do a lot of really terrible stuff, uh, you're heading down a trajectory that ultimately leads in really, you know, bad stuff. You've set yourself up for bad stuff to happen to you. You've set yourself on a trajectory for hell, right? Whereas if you lead a good life and you try to identify with Christ and you try to live a morally upright life and all these things I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, then you're aiming your trajectory towards heaven, towards beatitude, okay? So that's the idea of divinization or theosis. And... Everything about the church and all the things the church teaches, all the sacraments and all the prayers of the church, are meant to aid us in this goal of more closely identifying ourselves with Christ. So here's another good quote from the Catechism. 
or a paraphrase because I was typing this real fast. What faith confesses the sacraments communicate, okay, so we believe certain things and the sacraments make those things a reality or they give them to us. So what faith confesses the sacraments communicate. Christians are the children of God, partakers of the divine nature, called to live a life worthy of the gospel, made possible by the gifts of grace and the Holy Ghost, which is received through the sacraments and prayer. So there's a lot in those few sentences or phrases there. Uh, we are called to live a life that's worthy of the gospel. So we know that there's some interaction here with sacred tradi tradition and the Holy Scripture uh, that's going to give us some insight into what we're supposed to be doing in living this life in Christ. We know that we are seen as the apple of God's eye because through baptism we're made children of God. God is our Father. We're adopted sons and daughters of God. This is all made possible through the reception of the sacraments, which communicate grace. Prayer communicates grace. We're going to talk more about grace as we go along, what grace is. And this is also made possible by the indwelling, once we're baptized and when we're in a state of grace, of the Holy Ghost in our lives, in our, in our person. We have an indwelling. And that makes us participators, partakers of the life of the Holy Trinity. All right? So let's dig into this. I have no idea if this is going in the order of this. So I'll just close this and set it over here. All right. So we're created in the image and likeness of God. Every person, as I said, is created for a specific purpose, and that is to become a saint, to live with God in heaven. Uh, we are destined for eternal beatitude. But as we've talked about in the class, in fact, I taught the class on original sin, so I know you're all experts, uh, our birthright to this eternal beatitude is, has been taken from us by original sin. Original sin has corrupted our nature uh, to such an extent that uh, we are now kind of subject to our passions. I'm going to talk about what passions are. We're subject to whims. We're subject to concupiscence. Everyone remembers what that means, right? That's the idea that we tend towards the bad. Uh, we, have a, we have to fight against it. So we have a tendency to abuse the freedom that God's given us. And so tonight I'm also going to talk about freedom. Our reason tells us what we are to do uh, and what is good and what is evil and what we should avoid. And notice that that's our reason. So everybody has reason, so that law obliges everybody. It's rooted in our conscience, and that's another thing I'm going to talk about tonight is conscience. So each person is called to live a moral life that bears witness to the dig dignity of the person. So we're going to see that we owe a duty not only to God, but also to each other. Many times throughout the day and throughout our lives, though, we clearly fail in living up to both of those responsibilities, both to God and to our neighbor. And why do we fail? Um, we fail due to our concupiscence, our own personal bad habits, uh, a lot of people will say that we fail due to the temptation of some sort of devil or demon or that Satan is tempting us. I was listening to a homily by a, uh, a priest and he was talking about uh, how we tend to give way too much credit to Satan. He pointed out that there's one Satan and there's six billion people and Satan is really not that concerned about your little daily life to be messing around with you. He doesn't need to waste his time tempting you. So stop blaming Satan and blame your own personal bad habits for your sins. I think that's a very good point. So we know that we're subject to these sorts of bad habits and concupiscence and all this and that. And we're fighting against it every day, or at least, you know, we're trying to fight against it. Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection, merited new life for us in the Holy Ghost. And he won the grace that restores, uh, restores to us what sin has damaged. So as I said... The original sin, our birthright was taken away from us. So God, in his mercy, saw fit to restore our birthright to us by uh, sending down his son to suffer and die for us and to merit the grace that we need to convert back. So what is grace? Grace, this is a definition given in the Catechism. Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature, and of eternal life. It is participation in the life of the Holy Trinity. So this is what grace is. We receive converting grace. This would be the grace of baptism 
or uh, if we have fallen into mortal sin, the grace to return to the church through the sacrament of reconciliation. We receive that sort of converting grace as an unmerited gift of God. We can't merit that sort of grace. There were people in the church, in the early church, who thought that we could. They were Pelagians, and they were heretics. We can't merit converting grace. No one can merit the grace of baptism. This is the original justifying grace, okay? But when we're in the state of grace, when we ha have not committed mortal sin, after we've been baptized, uh, we can merit what's called actual grace. And this is not actual in the sense of it's real. This is actual in the sense of it's ordered toward action, act, actual grace, okay? And actual grace is the grace like the grace I asked for to be able to give a talk on something I don't know anything about with like an hour's notice to help me in this action of delivering this talk. I asked God to give me the actual grace to do it. Uh, and so that's what I mean. So not only when we're in the state of grace can we merit actual grace for ourselves, we can merit actual grace for other people. Uh, we could merit, uh, the saints can merit actual, or could, could ask for grace for us through, the, through their merits. The Blessed Virgin Mary obviously intercedes for us in terms of gaining for us the actual grace to battle against ourselves and, and against the world. And we, as I said, can merit actual grace for other people. So for example, here's a good example. You can go to Mass and maybe you don't know this. When you go to Mass, you should have your own intentions in mind. The priest is saying the Mass for a particular intention because somebody has paid him to do it. And so we can go to Mass with our own intentions. And so we bring an intention to the Mass. So you might say, you know, uh, you know we might go to Mass tomorrow. We're going we're gonna to offer our assistance to the Mass for, our, for Randy because we know he's sick. And so we bring that intention to the Mass. And then during the offertory part of the Mass, the part of the Mass where the priest is first talking about the bread and wine and, you know, blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, that part, then we think of some particular uh, uh, intention that we have uh, for the sacrifice uh, uh, at the altar. It doesn't have to be the same as your intention for, the, for your assistance at Mass. It could be something else. Maybe you have a sick grandmother and you want to offer this Mass for her. So we can merit actual grace for people. Our task, therefore, is to remain in the state of sanctifying grace and to merit actual grace for ourselves and others. Participating fully in the sacraments and prayer is of great importance in fulfilling our vocation to sainthood. So obviously, when we're in a state of sanctifying grace, what does that mean? That means that we are not in mortal sin, first of all, and it means that our trajectory is the good one. Our trajectory is going toward heaven. Now, we might have a stopover in purgatory, and that's why we need the actual grace to battle against our, our habitual sins, for example. Um, but if we are in a state of mortal sin, our trajectory is toward hell. So there are somewhat clearly defined uh, ideas here. I mean, the, the fact is, Catholicism is as simple as this. If you die in a state of grace, you go to heaven. If you die in a state of mortal sin, you go to hell. So what does that tell you? What's the bare minimum you can do to go to heaven? You convert on your deathbed, you receive the sacraments, you get baptized if you haven't been baptized, and then you go to heaven. It's really that simple. That's how merciful God is. He's given us very clearly defined rules here. Um, and if you die in a state of mortal sin, well, hopefully God is merciful. <laughs> right? So, that's the first part of my talk. Any questions about this? I'm going to go into some of these terms a little bit more in a minute. I've got to make a stop off of the Beatitudes according to the Catechism here. Hello. So, any questions so far? Whew. What's that? Got one. All right. Now is when it gets more complicated. So, as I said, we're kind of throwing a hodgepodge of stuff in here. So, the next thing to discuss is the Beatitudes. This is where you'll remember Christ is giving a Sermon on the Mount, and he decides to talk about, blessed are this group of people and that group of people and this other group of people, right? Wrong! He's talking about uh, everybody, not different groups of people. He's talking about everybody. Blessed are all these different categories of people, but we're all the same people. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. So what is, what is Christ telling us here? He's telling us about the way to eternal life. So let me read this. What, what, what translation do you read? That is Douay Reims. Um, so I'm going to read this very long quote from St. John Chrysostom because I think it perfectly encapsulates the idea that I'm talking about here where these are, this is kind of the progression of the spiritual life encapsulated by the, the Beatitudes. So let's check it out. St. John Chrysostom. It is not without reason that the Beatitudes are disposed of in this order. Each preceding one prepares the way for what immediately follows, furnishing us in particular with spiritual arms of such graces as are necessary for obtaining the virtue of the subsequent beatitude. Thus the poor in spirit, i.e. the truly humble, will mourn for their transgressions, and whoever is filled with sorrow and confusion for his own sins cannot be, but be just, and behave to others with meekness and clemency when possessed of these virtues. He then becomes pure and clean of heart, Peace of conscience reigns in this assemblage of virtues and cannot be expelled by the, cannot be expelled the soul by any tribulations, persecutions, or injustices of men. So you see that this isn't different groups of people that are going to be blessed in these very specific circumstances. This is the roadmap to obtaining virtues that Christ has set forth. That each subsequent virtue cannot be obtained without first perfecting the preceding virtue. I'm going to talk about virtues here at the end of this talk. So God put us in the world to know, love, and serve Him, and, to come to, and so to come to paradise. And that is beatitude. And so these are called the beatitudes. We can see that uh, linguistic connection. And the beatitude itself, that is heaven, makes us partakers of the divine nature and eternal life. So by following this roadmap, we become more closely identified with Christ and start living that life in Christ. And we therefore become partakers of the divine nature. And that is we are on the proper trajectory here. Okay. So the, this beatitude calls us to confront decisive moral choices, purify our hearts of bad instincts, and seek to love God. So we have to make decisions. We are rational actors operating in a world where good things happen, bad things happen, and we, make, we have to decide kind of sometimes on the spot or with some sort of recollection what's good and what's bad. What are we going to decide in this, that, or some other circumstance? So what is that? Well, that is freedom. Freedom is the power to act or to not act, and it's rooted in reason and will. Freedom is perfected only when it is directed toward God. In this life, as I said, and as we all know, there's a possibility of choosing evil or choosing good. But I think we all know from our personal experiences and from our casual observation of the world that the more one chooses the good, the more, one likely, the more likely one is to choose the good in the future, whereas when one chooses the evil, the more likely one is to choose the evil in the future. If you haven't noticed that yet, uh, come to work with me tomorrow. <laughs> the more one does what is good, the freer one becomes. Okay? So we have to throw out our idea as Americans of what, me, what freedom is. The thing that we call freedom here in America is not freedom according to what the church says freedom is. The freedom that we have in America is license to do whatever you want so long as it doesn't bother me or so long as it doesn't bother the lawgiver, the government. This is particularly pertinent right now, I think, given all we have going on with uh, the so-called freedom that our government wants to give everyone, right? They really want to give everyone license. Freedom in terms of the church is the freedom to turn away from the slavery of sin, freedom from the slavery of sin, and to turn toward the good. So freedom in its most perfect form is to always choose the good. That's the only way we can be truly free. That's what freedom is. The choice to disobey God and do what is evil is an abuse of freedom, and as I said, it leads to the slavery of sin. And we need to be aware that there's a difference between what our culture tells us as freedom and what is actual freedom. We need to be aware that what our culture wants to impose on us is license to do whatever we want. And that is not freedom. Grace does not rival freedom. The more docile we are to grace, the more we grow in inner freedom and confidence during trials. So, 
in Galatians 5, 1, it says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Now, that doesn't make any sense when you think about freedom as license. One sec. Oh, Galatians 5, 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. There you have it. So, if you think about that in terms of license, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would, why would God want to set us free to, to choose whatever we want, to impose our, you know, kind of errant sort of freedom on anybody else? No. Our freedom is to choose the good. And grace doesn't override our freedom. God loves us enough, enough that he is letting us make our own way, if you will. He's letting us choose. He's giving us assistance, obviously, with the help of actual grace. And the interaction between um, freedom, our freedom, our free will, God's omnipotence, the interaction of grace in our lives, and, it's, and the assistance of grace is a great mystery of the church. So you'll notice that whenever we can't really explain how certain things interact with each other, uh, we have to conclude that it's a mystery. And really any sort of uh, attempt to define it further than that, uh, you're always going to run into some sort of error. Um, and even the great theologians of the church have tried to define what the interaction is between predestination and freedom. I'm coming to you. Um, and they disagree. So there's different schools of this. There's a Thomistic school. Is there the Augustinian school? Um, the two great theologians in the church, they can't even agree about the interaction with these things. So uh, I certainly am not going to try. And I was going to talk a little bit about that. I decided to just tell you that people don't agree on this and leave it there at the great uh, saints can agree. Yeah, and I think that's, that's an interesting way to say it because um, I think that true freedom, probably using these definitions, is a complete slavery to Christ. We are, we are choosing to enslave ourselves to, I mean, you couldn't choose a better master to be, you know, to be a slave to, right? And so we're choosing it. The best way to exercise, exercise our freedom is to choose that master instead of choosing sin as our master. Right. And that is a situation, what he's saying is, that essentially, we're never going to always choose good. We're always going to make mistakes because we're going to make errors in judgment. We're going to talk about that when we talk about conscience and things. And we can't ever always choose good until we're completely slaves of Christ. Now, in the lives of some saints, you will see that they were completely enslaved to Christ, if you will, while they lived. And I think that that's a difficult uh, condition for any of us to reach. But that should be our goal. Because if our goal, if we're going to take our calling to holiness seriously, and we're going to take our calling to, to be saint seriously, I mean, that's the way to do it. Our goal isn't to kind of uh, ease our way into the, into the lowest rung of purgatory. No, our goal is to skip over purgatory altogether and go directly to heaven, right? Uh, so we want to identify ourselves as closely with Christ as possible in this life. Okay? What, then slavery? Oh. Yeah. I want to use a better term, but I see what you're saying. I, I, I You'll have to take that up with the church. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, you got to take that up with St. Paul because he used it, not me. He actually used that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah, many times. Many times. You got, you got a quote for us, Jerry? <laughs> I have not got my pen. <laughs> How about two? Throw two at us. <laughs> Well, and as you were starting to talk, it reminded me of the gospel we just heard, right? We're choosing a master whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Uh, we certainly don't choose that when we make ourselves slaves of sin, do we? Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Very good, very good. No, no. You know, we're talking about free will is the freedom to all, truly free will is the freedom to always choose to be in harmony with the will of Christ. Right. And I'm going to talk a little bit about action here in a second. Yeah. Essentially is indeed, as the Apostle Paul says, slavery to Christ's will. Yeah. Which isn't really slavery. No, because it's easy in light, right? <laughs> and so uh, we have now, we see. That freedom is the freedom to act. And so let's talk a little bit about human acts. So we as people, as rational actors acting in our freedom, are, we have responsibility for every act that we freely choose. This is going to get a little bit technical, so bear with me. <clears throat> the morality of an act depends upon three things. The object of the action the end in view or the intention of the actor and the circumstances of the action. So we have an object, we have a subject, and then we have circumstances kind of in the periphery of the world here. That's how we are supposed to gauge every action. Good intention doesn't make a disordered behavior justified. The end does not justify the means. So if I, as a rational actor, uh, choose, so there's some object in the world that is uh, intrinsically bad, for example, and I'm a rational actor and I choose it, but I'm choosing it based on some kind of good intention. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of people in the world and not a whole lot of food, so I, my intention is to kill half the people so that we can all have more food. So I have a good intention there. I want to feed, feed half of us, right? Uh, or I want to feed everybody. I have a good intention. But that, that end doesn't justify the means. That's not a, that's, can't do that. Not allowed. A morally good act requires goodness of the object, goodness of the end, and goodness of the circumstances. An evil end corrupts action even if the object is good. So this kind of goes back to what I was talking about on Sunday. Prayer and fasting, in order to be seen by men, for example, we have a good intention, or we have a good object, we have good circumstances, but we don't have a good intention there. Our intention is wrong. Uh, we're trying to please men instead of trying to please God. And so that makes our, what would otherwise be a morally good act, all of a sudden is, a, is an evil act. So we've talked about the intentions, we've talked about um, the objects. The objects are always either, a, some objects, sorry, are always either objective, <coughs> Some objects are always objectively wrong and morally evil. So there are some things that are what would be called uh, objectively grave matter if we're talking in terms of what moral sin is. Some things are always going to be bad. Fornication, blasphemy, murder, adultery, these things are always objectively evil. And so we, shouldn't, we can never choose those objects. Now, I was trying to anticipate someone raising their hand, which I'm glad to see no one did, who was going to say... I thought we could kill people. They break into our house and they're trying to kill us. I thought we could kill them back. That's, That's not murder. That's homicide. Homicide and murder have different meanings. Murder is like a premeditated act where you go and kill somebody. Homicide is just the taking of a human life. So there's a difference between murder and homicide. Really right. That's why it's not murder. So, therefore, the intention and the circumstances are one factor when determining the morality of human actions. So it's important that we recognize that we're actors and we're looking at these different objects and choosing among them, choosing the good, the bad. Some of them, as Gene was pointing out, are sometimes morally neutral. Uh, like, I want to choose between uh, going to a movie or going to a restaurant. That, that could be a morally neutral decision. God really doesn't care which one we choose. Now, if it's, uh, I'm going to go see this uh, movie that has really questionable content or I'm going to go to dinner, uh, then there's a good or a bad, right? Right, you can't pick that one. That would be objectively evil. And so we are always making choices. So we know from our own experience that our choices are 
Well, let's reflect on our own experience here. When we make a choice, there's a lot that goes into choices. Now, sometimes we don't really think about it, so that's one thing. Sometimes we just choose stuff. You know, we'll just say something kind of stupid or whatever, snarky or what have you. I do that anyway. Uh, without really thinking about it, so that's one thing. But sometimes we have, you know, motivations that may seem clear to us. They may be somewhat cloudy. Um, and so these are going to get into what our passions are. Passions are emotions or movement of the appetites that incline us to act or not act in regard to something felt or imagined to be good or evil. So passions are somewhat different for everybody, I would suppose. Um, we're not, we don't mean like passion like, oh, romance novel passion. No, we're talking about uh, passion, in, I guess, in the Greek philosophical sense of passion. We have certain, um, you know, we have a tendency to go toward this sort of thing or that sort of thing. Uh, some people would have a, a passion toward, you know, uh, extravagance, and some people would have a passion toward, uh, I don't know, whatever the opposite of extravagance is. No one in America has that, but some, you know. All right. But passions are in themselves neither good nor bad, morally speaking. Uh, and they're a natural part of the human psyche. In fact, the passions are a God-given gift because they connect the life of the senses, our sense experience, with the life of the mind. So we can see something and our mind is going to start making judgments about it based on what our passions are. So they're neither good or evil themselves, uh, but they are good when they contribute to a good action and evil in the opposite case. So we have to, as St. Paul talks about in his epistles, we have to get our passions under control. We have to, here we go again, enslave our flesh to our will, right? We have, to have, uh, we have to exercise our rationality and our will to control ourselves. Now, as a side note, I think we talked about this a little bit on Sunday when we were talking about the whole idea of fasting during Lent. And that is that we want to be able to basically, if you're going to say it in simple terms, prove to ourselves that we can control ourselves. Right? We don't all have a passion toward food or you know, whatever you want to fast from. But we're, 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 we're mastering our flesh and we're making our flesh subject to our will so that we can control our passions, so that we can order them toward good things instead of toward evil things. You remember Plato's analogy of the white horse and the black horse and the chariot driver? And you've got to keep the, the drives and the white horse and the black horse in line. The black horse wants to call over here and do bad things. Exactly. We're like that. We're bad horses. <laughs> So an upright will orders the movements of the senses it appropriates to the good and to beatitude, and evil will succumbs to disordered passions and exacerbates them. So once again, we're back on my idea that we want to aim our trajectory toward heaven. We want to aim our trajectory toward God. And so we want to subject our passions, our flesh, and our, all these things to the good. And we want to make sure that we're ordering our lives toward the good. How are we going to do that? Let me get there in a minute. Moral perfection involves being moved to the good, not by will alone, but by man's sensitive appetite. So the higher good, if you will, would be to have kind of a natural disposition toward uh, the pure love of God. So as we read in the Psalms, my heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. So heart and flesh are somewhat different than the will. Um, we, are, we are trying to make it where our natural inclination, without our having to become to, to kind of subdue our, our lesser passions, we want our natural inclination, built up through various habits, to be always tending toward God. Whereas I think most of our experiences, if you're like me, our nat my natural inclination is to, is to go the other way. So I have to rein in my flesh, I have to rein in my passions, I have to rein in my senses, uh, through mortification, basically, is the thing. Uh, and prayer and fasting and that sort of thing. Uh, we have to rein in our senses so that our natural inclination, if you will, is pointed in the right trajectory. But isn't that by definition you make it the opposite of slavery? Well, we're enslaving ourselves, right? I'm trying to... I'm passionately pursuing this. I'm not <coughs> enslaving, I'm enslaving, being dragged toward. I'm passionately pursuing this. So it's something I want, not something I'm being forced into by bonding. Ah, uh, yes. But who is, pa who is the one who is pursuing it? Your, your will, right? Your will is pursuing it by putting all of your uh, lesser passions to rest. So you are actually enslaving your, your lesser passions because you recognize that there's a greater good, and that is God. Right? Right, yeah. 
We're going to get there. Don't jump ahead. Don't jump ahead. Yeah. Enslaving something is something that, like, life itself onto it, having it pull you, brother. This is something for me, anyway. I'm reaching toward it and trying to fight for it. No, in this case, you're getting the analogy wrong because you are the one who is doing the pulling. Your passions are trying to, to yeah. Right. You're, you're, you're doing that, Andy, but by the grace of God, you're doing it. Okay. Well, perhaps. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We're going to get there in a second. Okay. Yes, maybe. I'm not trying to confuse you. He is. I, I have this whole talk prepared. It all goes in order, and it's based on the catechism. <laughs> hey, I wrote this down. It's prepared. All right. So the principal passions are love and hatred, desire and fear, joy, sadness and anger. Passions. All right, so we've moved here from the idea that we are created in the image and likeness of God, and yet we have a fallen human nature. And so we know that we have to somehow be in a state of grace and, and coordinate with sanctifying grace and uh, ask God and merit this actual grace so that we can continue to live a life that's pointing in the right direction. Uh, we know that our ultimate goal is the Beatitudes. We know that in the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ has given us the road map that we have to follow in terms of virtue. And yet, we're free beings. And so we have to choose that of our own accord. And our freedom interplays with the way that we act. And our passions are hiding down there. And we have to mold our passions to be either good or bad. And so we have to subject our passions to our will. Yeah. And and I did, and I did, and I did, and I did, and I did it so much that it became an ingrained habit. And in, even in the last several years, I've known not to do that, and I still catch myself doing it. And it, so, is, is there anything to be said for improvement? You know, I mean, as yes. far as moral sin goes, like I mean, it's, I, I know it sounds a little bit silly that I can't control that. No, I think it makes better, perfect but sense. I still slip on it. Yeah, um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about virtue and um, sin and um, if you'll hang tight with me I think I'm going to address that because I think it's an important thing um, because basically the phenomenon that you're describing is what I'm getting at when I talk about when we've kind of set our passions on certain things um, we have a tendency to, f to follow along that path right um, so yeah hang on a sec um, so, in addition to our passions, we have to deal with our conscience, okay? And the moral conscience enjoins a person at the appropriate moment to do good or evil. So, if we have trained our passions in such a way, and we have subjected them, and we are pointing toward the good, it naturally follows that we have aided our conscience in making appropriate decisions based on what we know to be good or evil, right? Does that make sense? So we're on the same path. Our conscience judges the things that we have been discussing here, approving of the good and denouncing the evil. So it's kind of like the gatekeeper of our actions. Uh, so even though we might have, like what uh, Kelly's talking about, we might have a passion that uh, leads us down this right road or whatever, we, she, now she can recognize by having now formed her conscience better than it was previously formed, she can recognize that this blasphemy is a problem, which, you, you know, you may not know that before, so now you have to recognize at first that it's a problem, and our conscience tells us it's a problem. And so we're going to, next in my next section, talk about what, how do we combat that once we recognize it as a problem. And one way is called interiority. This is basically the idea of being present to oneself. Um, now, if you know anything about Eastern religion, you know that that's kind of the main thing, is being mindful of each moment. And I think that it's somewhat undervalued in Christianity because in order to really recognize, like you're talking about, sometimes we just make slips based on our bad habits. Um, whereas if we were being more mindful, more interiorly recollected, we would recognize that we're about to say something stupid. 
uh, or we would recognize this is, an, uh, this is a time where I need to exercise my conscience, I need to exercise my freedom, I need to rein in my passions and make the right choice. So the first step I would argue is to, uh, before really applying any of the virtues to combat it, is to simply recognize that there are certain occasions when this is going to come up, uh, certain conversations perhaps, or you know, depending on what your vice is, and that you need to be particularly recollected at that point to be able to fight against it. Okay? Now, this is the sort of thing that is aided by, uh, I would say, frequent confession, even if it's confession of venial sin. Um, so in your case, if you, uh, we're going to talk about this in a second, so with, in the case of blasphemy, um, it, may or may, it, would, it would normally be mortal sin because it's subjectively a grave matter. Okay? Um, and it is, but in your case, it's not done with free consent of the will because it's done out of habit. Okay? So that makes it a venial sin. But you still are fighting against it because uh, you want to root it out because you know that it's objectively evil. And so you would take that to confession and you would confess it until you're able to stamp it out. Because the confession gives the sacramental grace that goes along with the confession and it gives you the grace to battle against whatever it is you're confessing, particularly when you're habitually confessing like that, confessing every week or every couple days or whatever if it happens that often. And so that is... In a sense, it's an actual grace that's helping you so that the next time comes around, several things are going to happen. First of all, you're going to say, man, it's going to be really embarrassing when I have to tell the priest the same thing again. So that's kind of the human aspect of it. And, this, and I, I personally think that that's a, a specific grace of the sacrament of confession that keeps you from doing it again, uh, is the, the humility, the, the uh, I don't know, embarrassment of having to confess it multiple times to the same priest. Uh, I think that people who kind of confession shop miss out on that embarrassment that helps a lot. Um, so I would caution against doing that. But you see what I'm saying there. You're going to want to uh, bring it to confession. First of all, the priest is going to give you advice. You receive the actual grace. You receive the gift of the embarrassment. And uh, you go from there. The other thing is about being interiorly recollected is that sometimes we'll sin and we don't even notice it. Because it's just habit or whatever. It's such, it's such an ingrained habit that we might not even notice it. So the good thing is, is that you're noticing it. I'm talking about not noticing it beforehand and doing it anyway. I'm talking about noticing it afterward and going, ah, crap. So um, being recollected, even if it's a second later you notice it, you're still on the path, I think, to doing good there because it could have been that you hadn't noticed it at all. So the, the noticing that you've sinned, even venially, is another grace that God gives us to kind of get on the straight path. Um, so, the fact that you noticed it is, I think, already a grace from God to, to help you along the path of rooting it out. I hate to keep talking to Kelly. We all have this. Everybody has this sort of, everybody has something like this in their lives or multiple things. The other thing is, if you have multiple things like that, where you know that this is a habitual sin, um, the best advice is probably to not try to root them out all at the same time. Like, uh, I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to stop blaspheming and I'm going to stop uh, having these lustful thoughts and I'm going to stop uh, stealing office supplies that are minor and I'm going to stop, um, you know, uh, some other venial sin. Now, you would want to go to the confessional with, with the mortal sins, obviously, you have to. But you're going to want to probably focus on one at a time because if you shotgun your approach to getting rid of all these venial sins at once, you're going to miss the mark. So it may be best in a, in a, what I'm talking about is frequent confession where you don't have to confess anything, but you're choosing to as a devotional. You're going to probably want to focus on one thing and say, I'm battling against these habitual venial sins of blasphemy at this point. I have other habitual sins too, but these are what I'm focusing on now. When you confess venial sin, you don't have to confess it in number, and you don't have to confess every venial sin. You can pick and choose which venial sins you confess, and you don't have to say how many times you did it. When you confess mortal sin, you've got to say every mortal sin, you've got to say how many times you did it. You don't have to do that with venial sin. So you can pick and choose, and you can say it like that, like, uh, I'm battling against habitual sin of, you know, X, Y, or Z. Pick one. So if you go to confession weekly or whatever, I always mention that at the end. You know, pick a few specific ones, but, um, and if you do know the number, you'd want to mention that, but um, you would want to bring it to the confessional, obviously. Okay. Um, so being aware of it, doing the examination of conscience at the end of the day, or in the midday, and then at the end of the day, in the morning, uh, looking back at the portion of the day that you're examining and recognizing it with, with the gift of hindsight and the grace of God, where did I fail 
Uh, where did I succeed? Uh, was there a time that I was going to blaspheme and then I caught myself beforehand and give thanks to God for the fact that he gave you the grace, the actual grace. That's, that's a good example of actual grace. It's combated at that point. Um, so you're going to need to do that. That's a, being interiorly recollected. Examination of conscience is a way to build up that interior recollection. We have to form our conscience. That's kind of what we're talking about. We have to recognize these things are wrong. Our judgments must be formulated according to reason and in conformity with the true good willed by the Creator. And here's the other thing with your situation, with all of our situations, with regard to these venial sins, is that um, it's a lifelong task. We're never going to root out every venial sin that we have. Uh, even the great saints, uh, some of them, if you read the hagiographies, they come across as sinless and um, perfect people, and I'm sure that some of them were, um, and those were probably the guys who lived in the caves in the desert and didn't have to ever interact with another human being. <laughs> um, but we have to be patient with ourselves, uh, and that's very important. And we have to recognize that, I mean, you know, Christ instituted the sacrament of confession so that we would use it. It shouldn't be embarrassing. It's something we're supposed to go do. It's a normal thing to go to the sacrament. Now, uh, just like, I mean, it's really just as normal as receiving the Eucharist as far as I'm concerned. And it's a lot more fun because you get more advice. I mean, you need to talk to somebody about your problem. All predispositions to good will help everything else. In other words, if you have uh, several different sins that you're working on, if you predisposition yourself to the good in one, it will help the other. And as you get into the habit of establishing virtues within your life, uh, one virtue will help another. Yeah, and it's like, uh, yeah. So how do we illuminate our conscience? How do we know what's right and what's wrong? Well, that's a, that's a pretty easy answer, and it is that we refer to the sacred tradition of the church, and we refer to Holy Scripture. So we have the guidebook that tells us what is right and what's wrong, and it's called the Catechism. Uh, read it, and it'll tell you what's right and what's wrong. Uh, you can use the distilled versions of examination of the conscience that people have prepared, uh, but in essence, we're just reflecting on what the church teaches and what's right and what's wrong. Uh, I was noticing, as I was looking through here uh, earlier for an opening prayer, thankfully Father came in and rescued us from all that, um, that, um, you know, it has in here, this is not the best uh, version of uh, an examination, but it has an abridgment of Christian doctrine. It has the Ten Commandments, so you would look at that. The precepts of the church, the sacraments, and the Beatitudes, and the works of mercy. And so you would uh, reflect on those things and see, you know, where are you failing, where are you, where are you succeeding. <coughs> the interesting thing is that uh, you would think that you could just uh, neglect to learn the rules and then they wouldn't apply to you, wouldn't you? But you can't. Uh, because that would be too easy. So one cannot neglect to form the conscience as an excuse for evil conduct. We have an obligation to form the conscience. So the mere fact of failing to inform your conscience is a sin in itself. And the same is true for habitual sin. It can blind the conscience and it has to be addressed. Uh, so once, I've said this several times before, we have a tendency to uh, justify ourselves by saying, well, this is, I'm just like that. I'm just, a, I'm just an angry person. Right? No. You're a sinful person. That's what you tell yourself. That be sort of like a dereliction of duty. <laughs> What's that? Like if, if sins were general order that you didn't you know, go against. You know, yeah. Not informing yourself that this was the way would be a dereliction of duty. Yes, that's a good way to look at it. That's a very good way to look at it. Yes, we have an obligation to learn. Now that I've said that, I will say this. Invincible ignorance can be an excuse. So, uh, if you were from a society who had no idea that they needed to form the conscience or that there was a supreme lawgiver or a church that uh, clarifies what the law is, you might be invincibly ignorant, and that could be an excuse. So, I'm going to think of a stupid example, like uh, you come from a culture where everybody just murders everybody else. Well, the conduct, as you can see, is still evil because I've said that murder is always intrinsically evil, uh, and yet you might be invincibly ignorant. Now, 
You got a question the interplay here between, as I said, we all have reason and we all know what's naturally good and naturally bad, particularly <coughs> something like that. That's just an example to show. Uh, I don't think invincible ignorance is a good thing to rely on. So, the more a correct conscience prevails, the more do persons and groups turn aside from blind choice and try to be guided by objective standards of moral conduct. So that's what we're all trying to do. Follow this trajectory. Now, one way to get on this trajectory toward God is the virtues. The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. The idea of theosis or divinization that I was talking about at the beginning. Virtues are firm attitudes, stable dispositions, habitual perfections of intellect and will that govern actions, order passions, and guide conduct. And this is where I was, I was, gonna, I was messing with Jerry earlier. These sorts of virtues are acquired by human effort, and they are the fruit and seed of morally good acts. Now, just because they're acquired by effort, and that's why I say I was messing with Jerry, just because we know that these are acquired by human effort doesn't mean that we don't need God's actual grace to help us along the path. Of course we do. We can do nothing by ourselves except fail. Um, but the reason I didn't want to say that it's all God's grace is because that takes away our responsibility. We have a responsibility to form our consciences and every day to battle against our lower selves. So to say, you know, well, you know, this happened or that happened, uh, it was God's grace or it was God's will or whatever, it's, we use it as an excuse. Theologically speaking, it may be correct, but most of the time when people say it, and I'm, I know Jerry is not saying it this way, we use it as an excuse. So what we need to do, and this is the good rule of thumb, is every time we fail, we need to recognize we did that. And every time we succeed, we need to recognize God did that. Because we really are awful at trying to run our own lives. Exactly, yes. So what he, basically what he's saying is, I'll put it in the theological terms, okay? The original converting grace, the justifying grace, as I mentioned earlier, cannot be merited. But once we're in a state of justified grace, once we are baptized and we haven't committed mortal sin, we can do actions because we're now, you know, we're part of the Holy Trinity at that point in, in essence. And so our actions kind of pull from the superabundance of merit that Christ earned on the cross to merit for ourselves or for whoever we're, we're, we're working for at this point. Um, so Christ has already merited all the graces that could ever be existing. But through our works, this is where the Catholic works come in, through our works, we can, I guess, decide how those graces are going to be appropriated to a certain extent. Right, yes. Exactly. So there's a storehouse of merit, won by Christ, partaken of by the saints, and so they can access it. And we can also access it when we're in a state of grace, by our works. And uh, if you want to know what sort of works I'm talking about, we can look at the... I'm not going to find it. Spiritual works of mercy, corporal works of mercy. And you can read those. The church has works. Do those works. <coughs> or, the, you know, like I was talking about, going to Mass and that sort of thing. So, virtues are acquired by human effort. So what are the cardinal virtues? Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Those are the four cardinal virtues. Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Prudence disposes practical reason to discern true good in every circumstance and choose the right means to achieve it. So it's basically, what is good and how do you get there? Prudence. Justice is a constant and firm will to give due to God and neighbor. I think I mentioned before that, you know, like failure to pray for a day is a sin. And it's a sin against justice. Because we owe it to God to interact with Him because He constantly interacts with us, right? So out of justice, we owe God our prayer. And so by failing to pray for even a day, we have sinned against justice. We can also sin against justice uh, with regard to our neighbors, obviously, if we treat them unjustly. And so we want to cultivate the virtue of justice. Yes?
What, failing to pray? The priest was wrong. Yeah, there could have been some sort of attenuating circumstances, but I confess it. Keep confessing it because I think it's a sin against justice. And it also comes into this next one, and that is fortitude. And this fortitude is kind of related to interior recollection that I was talking about. Uh, and I personally think that, and as far as the cardinal virtues go and upon the path to holiness, I think fortitude is really where you've got to start. At least in my spiritual path, I think fortitude is where you've got to start. Fortitude ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in pursuit of the good. It's so easy to wake up in the morning and say a morning offering and, uh, uh, you know, go to Mass and, and, you know, you're feeling pretty good about the day and you've done a lot of really spiritual good stuff in the morning and then you get to work and you talk to the first person and it all falls apart. That's a lack of fortitude. It's really a lack of interior recollection. It's a, it's a failure to apply the, the graces and the fruits that God has given you in the sacraments and your morning prayer to the actual daily life. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you can be as holy as you want when you're in the church, and then you go to the world and you screw it all up, and, you know, what you've accomplished in the church means nothing, really. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lack... I don't know if it's a lack of faith, because you still believe. Yeah. Yeah, what... Yeah, what I'm talking about is not so much encountering the person and giving up on the faith. What I'm talking about is encountering them and failing to uh, recognize that it's an opportunity to do good. Fortitude, yeah. It's also establishing resilience. Right. In Right. Yeah, and that's that's the best point right there. And that is, you want to dispose yourself to good. I mean, that's what we're all that's what we're talking about. That's a great point. Hey, Doug, can you give me something to drink, man. You get no. All right. So the last cardinal virtue is temperance. Temperance moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. Temperance. We all know what temperance is. Okay, so those are the cardinal virtues, and those are acquired through human effort. Let's talk about the three theological virtues, which are acquired only by a gift of God, and they are infused in baptism. They have God as their origin, motive, and object. And they dispose people to live in a relationship with the Holy Trinity. The first is faith. Uh, this is the theological virtue where we believe in God and all that He said and revealed, and we believe everything the Holy Mother Church proposes for our belief. Faith remains in everyone who hasn't sinned against it, uh, and one of the main consequences to committing mortal sin is the loss of these virtues. I mean, once you're in a state of mortal sin, you're helpless. Uh, you can't merit anymore. God doesn't really hear your prayers when you're in a state of mortal sin, except your prayers for conversion. Uh, and so, when you're in a state of mortal sin, you're really in bad shape. You're utterly dependent on the grace of God and the mercy of God to bring you to the confessional and get back in right relationship. The second theological virtue is hope. We desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life, placing trust in Christ's promises and rely not on our strength, but the help of grace and the Holy Ghost. Hope. And the third theological virtue is charity. We love God above all things for his own sake, and we love our neighbor for the love of God. So those are the three theological virtues. All right. Now let's talk about sin. And that's really where this whole talk has been leading. We've talked about freedom and passions and choosing good and choosing evil. And what it all boils down to in reality is, I've given you kind of the blueprint behind how do we end up sinning and how do we end up doing the good instead of sinning. Uh, and so we want to 
Uh, subdue our passions, form our consciences, all in an effort to avoid choosing sin when presented with the opportunity to sin. And we want to make sure that we always choose the best good uh, when presented with that option. Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It's failure in, gener in genuine love of God and neighbor caused by perverse attachment to certain goods. Sin at its base is an offense against God. And we can see this manifested in the passion of Christ where uh, sin manifests itself in, in the most awful violence and hatred and, and, and that sort of thing. So there's two types of sins. I'm going to go over this one more time. There's the venial sin. Uh, when one commits venial sin, it allows charity to subsist even though it offends and wounds it. So no matter how many times you sin venially, you're not cut off from the grace of God. You're still in a state of grace. But you have wounded your relationship with God and you've wounded your uh, charity toward God. Because every sin is an offense against God. But you're still in a state of grace. So you can still merit. You can, God will still hear your prayers. Uh, God will still hear your prayers for actual grace. Uh, for yourself and for others. He'll hear your intercessions for whomever. On the other hand, there's mortal sin that destroys charity in the heart of man by grave violation of God's law and turns man away from God by preferring an inferior good to him. And so, mortal sin, as I've said many times, cuts us off from the grace of God. When you're in a state of mortal sin, God doesn't hear your prayers because you're not in a relationship with him because you're no longer subsisting, if you will, in the Holy Trinity. You have no life of the Holy Trinity in you. You have no life of grace. And so, the only prayers that God hears at that point would be prayers for conversion to bring you to the sacrament of confession. Now, that shouldn't stop you from making acts of contrition and, and that sort of thing uh, for your mortal sin uh, if you're unable to go to, to confession very quickly. Uh, so, you should still pray during those times. You shouldn't say, well, I committed a mortal sin, it's all done for now, I'm just going to sleep in. Uh, <laughs> you should still pray because your prayers will uh, reach God essentially as prayers for conversion. I, I wanted to be sure I understood what you said. Is there something in the catechism that, that states that if you're in a state of mortal sin, God does not hear your prayer? Uh, yes, I don't have the exact... It's, I, I would guess it would, honestly, I would guess it would probably not be in the current catechism, but would be in the catechism of Trent. Um, I don't have it written down here. Um, but think about it logically, okay? If the whole point of being in a state of grace is to participate in the life of the Holy Trinity and to have the life of Christ in you, right? Uh, and to uh, be entitled to a beatific vision, so you're in a relationship with God. When you commit a mortal sin, you have chosen of your own free will to take yourself out of that relationship. You have chosen to turn away from your Father at that point, okay? And so it makes sense logically that God's going to hear your prayers for conversion at that point, but not necessarily going to hear your prayers for um, anything else. Um, now you can look back. Uh, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to explain to you how the church has taught this because I think it might offend some people. Um, but <laughs> thanks, Kelly. The church is taught, okay, now that Jean has raised the theological issues, I have to say. The church is thought, taught through the ordinary magisterium, the popes. Uh, the, the best example of this is Protestants, okay? And I didn't want to say the P word tonight. Um, that the church is, has taught throughout history of the church that God doesn't hear the prayers of Protestants because they're not in a state of grace. The only prayers that he hears at that point is a prayer that would convert. So he hears the converting prayers. Prayers to basically call down the grace of conversion in hopes of speeding that along. That's how we know that that's what the church teaching is. And um, if anyone wants the sites on that, I could give you the sites from the popes on that. Obviously the church hasn't been talking about that very much since the Second Vatican Council. I wouldn't have known how to 
conversion prayer because I didn't know what... Did. Okay, know that's a good question. The question is, um, when I'm talking about God hears the prayers for conversion, I don't mean that you have to say a specific prayer to convert. What I'm saying is that God is going to hear basically any prayer you make as a prayer of conversion. Like, oh, you know, uh, I'm praying for, you know, this out of the other thing. God is going to hear that as a prayer of conversion, essentially, is, is the idea. You don't have to say a specific prayer, is what it means. So it doesn't matter whether you know what conversion means or not. So if you think about it in this way. This is why I didn't want to talk about this. Thanks. This really has nothing to do with the talk. Let's, let's move on. Nope, we're moving on. Sorry. Nope, 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 nope. Sorry. Stop. Gene, stop. Stop, Gene. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> now go ahead, go ahead. Put it this way, it, it makes more sense. And you said it, but what you're saying is that for someone who is not Catholic or someone who is in a state of moral sin, uh, they may be praying to God to heal their neighbor who is ill. God will hear that prayer, but only as the prayer of someone seeking Him. Right. Yeah. He will not necessarily grant the petition, but He will hear the prayer as one who is seeking Him. Yes. Okay, that, yeah. that's, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah it that makes theological sense. Happen. But it's not a very good way to No, it means it, it, would, it would be converting, well, it, it, what I mean by converting, I mean uh, seeking, no, no, not necessarily. What it means is, converting has a very specific meaning, okay? It means basically receiving the sacrament of baptism, or if you have been baptized, receiving the sacrament of confession. That's what converting means. That's the way to convert, okay? So God is hearing... Yeah, all right. All right. Because the church recognizes the baptism as a promise. It does. So there's yes. an implication there. Yes. That God does indeed acknowledge. Yes, when a Protestant is baptized, they're in a state of sanctifying grace. Right. But, as I've said before, just because you're Protestant doesn't mean the rules don't apply to you. So if you commit a mortal sin as a Protestant, you still have to go to a Catholic priest to receive absolution for your sins. But if you don't know that. If you don't know it, the rules still apply to you. The rules don't stop applying, as I said, yeah. simply because you don't know. You have to form your conscience. But God, because He is merciful, does not mean that He cannot step out of that. He could, yes. We should not rely on God doing that. All right. Let's move on. Every time I talk about this, we've got to talk about Protestants. I've made it my new goal when I teach these classes to not talk about Protestants because, quite frankly... I don't want to def the Catholic Church to define itself in relationship to Protestants. Protestants define themselves in relationship to the Catholic Church. I'm telling you what the Catholic Church teaches. I don't, I don't want to offend you, but I don't really care what the Protestant churches teach. Uh, if you were here to learn about the Protestant churches, you came to the wrong place, because I've never been Protestant. I don't know anything about them. If you want to hear about atheism, I'll tell you all about it. It sucks. All right. <laughs> So, I'm not qualified to speak about Protestant theology. What I can tell you is what the church has always taught. I've told you that. All right. You know, one thing that we brought up. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we can never forget God's mercy. Right, because yes. God's mercy is going you know, to trump any, uh, any of our thoughts or ideas or yes. rules or what they do and what they don't do and who's right and who's wrong. Like, yes. So, I mean, that's something that makes all this make sense to me. Like, yes. God's mercy what? brought me here today, even though it might not have brought Joe Smith here today. That's exactly right. And the other thing I would say in that is we should not presume on God's mercy. We know that God has set forth very specific things. As I said, you could do a very minimalistic sorts of things and get into heaven as a Catholic, right? Those are the rules. Uh, God could choose to act outside His rules, but we shouldn't presume on his mercy by just assuming that everybody is going to get to heaven. Because if everybody's going to get to heaven, let's hope they do, but if, ever, but if it were that easy and we, we thought, well, there's a million different ways, uh, then I can tell you I would have a lot more free time. Because I wouldn't have to go to Mass or pray or do anything. Right, right. All right. Moral sin attacks the vital principle within us, charity. It necessitates a new initiative of God's mercy and a conversion. Conversion to go to the sacrament of, of penance. 
And as I said many times, the grace of conversion cannot be merited. Which makes sense, right? Particularly in light of the conversation we were just ha having. Right? So what are the conditions for a sin to be mortal sin? Well, the object has to be a grave matter. It has to be committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. So again, we have to form our conscience to be able to recognize these sorts of things. Sin itself, whether it's mortal or venial, creates a proclivity to sin. Now this is, I think, particularly true with habitual venial sins, but it's also very true with uh, mortal sin. Because once you're in a state of mortal sin, you no longer have the assistance of God, really, in terms of actual grace, right? Because you're not in a state of grace. And so you are not getting the sort of assistance that you need to fight against your uh, proclivities. Makes sense, logically. Sin is personal, but we can participate in the sins of others. In numerous ways. And this is something that we don't necessarily think about. We tend to be kind of selfish in terms of thinking about our sins, but... Uh, we can participate in the sins of others or become liable for the sins of others by uh, participating directly or voluntarily, by ordering, advising, praising, or approving them, uh, by not disclosing or not hindering them when we have an obligation to do so, or by protecting evildoers. So, um, you know, you could think of a lot of examples there. Um, if you had a... Uh, friend who was cohabitating, for example, and you were, and they were like, we're having a housewarming party for our uh, sinful uh, arrangement here. And you go over there and you take them a gift. You've sinned by basically saying, this is a good situation for you to be in, right? Um, now, I, the more complicated situation that I don't have to face is, if, you know, if this is like a daughter or a son doing this, uh, you have to kind of weigh whether you want to, you know, burn that bridge. You know, the good, you know, there may be some uh, good in still trying to communicate with them about it and advise them to the contrary. So, obviously, you know, there's no bright line rule in that regard. But we have to be mindful that our sin, or that we would incur sin by participating or advising people in their sin. So you'd be cool if you sent them instead of a telegram or, or a pentagram, a Billy Gram. <laughs> <laughs> or you could maybe, uh, you could maybe, uh, have a mass said for them and send them a card that says, I had mass said for you because you're sinning publicly. Where I wanted to close was by pointing out that this sort of participation in sin is what the church is very concerned about at this point with our government because our government is forcing all of us with our tax dollars to participate in the government's sin, right? And the government is funding these various evils with our tax dollars and we're necessarily paying that money to the government uh, because we have to, and we're participating in the sin of others by funding it. Now, the church has told us that that circumstance is so remote um, that we don't, we're not necessarily liable for that, because we're not giving our tax dollars specifically for that purpose. Um, but it's still something that we need to be aware of and to try to uh, rally against and to remedy so that we don't have to give our tax dollars to things that we consider uh, evil particularly true for me, given my current tax bill. Okay, so uh, that's where I wanted to end. I don't know if that covered the whole thing or not. I think it covered more, actually, but uh, if anybody has any questions about anything, even the topic that shall not be named, <laughs> I will answer them now. All right. Oh, we got one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, sometimes anger is justifiable. I think we talked about that on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think that that would typically be moral sin. Now, if you got angry and you hit the person, 
that might be because that would be pretty grave to strike someone else. You know. um, so probably not in that circumstance. Now I will I will say this: when you ha you're going to have questions that arise like that in your life as Catholics, and the best thing to do is to uh, go to confession and you know say whatever you're going to say, and then say to the priest like, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this is a, s a mortal sin or not, and then tell them about it, and then let them decide, and they'll tell you, and then you'll kind of have a guidepost. Now. Uh, if you go to a priest who tells you that not praying for a day isn't a sin, you, you probably don't want to ask that guy for advice about what's a sin and what's not. Uh, in fact, I would never go to confession with that priest again. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, it might not be a mortal sin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you failed to pray on, uh, you know, if you like got drunk and you were so hung over the next day you couldn't pray, that might be a mortal sin. That's, of course, getting drunk is a mortal sin. So you might have compounded it by failing to pray the next day. Right, my, yes? My, my question was to him, was that I literally laughed this week and sang, and how long I have to <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good point. Now, um, we, should, we should try to... Once, once we've set our, our minds on a particular path of prayer, for example, I mean, we can kind of, sometimes we'll get a little bit overzealous and we've got to rein ourselves back in. So we can't always use our past prayer as a, as a barometer for what we should be doing each day. Um, but I tend to confess it if, I'm, if, I'm, if I sense that I'm starting to get lukewarm. That's when you're going to want to confess it because you're, want to get, you're going to want to get the grace to combat the lukewarmness. So that's kind of the way that I would use it. Or if you just, you know, if you're filling your day with other things, materialist things, I would say, instead of taking the time out to pray, you know, uh, then I would, you would want to confess it because you're battling against, you're, you're coming up on lukewarmness and you want to try to avoid that. Okay? So now, yeah. I mean, if it's just in a particular occasion, it would depend upon what the situation was that you were angry about. You know, uh, was it about the church or was it, you know, you have to decide for yourself. So just because it's listed as a capital sin, it doesn't necessarily mean As a, yeah. That's what, the seven deadly sin, a capital sin. Yeah, I think, you know, you got to look at the gradation there. What's your, what's, what's, you know, we're, like we're talking about, you know, the object, the actor, and the circumstances. You're going to have to look at the circumstances there. Because sometimes our initial reaction is to get really mad at somebody. I mean, uh, it, it's like, you know, when you, like a, when you see a temptation. I mean, the sin is not in the fact that you were tempted. The sin is in uh, going, oh, now I'm, this is a great temptation, right? So when you see the anger and you latch on to it, that's when it becomes sinful. So if you latch on to it in such a way as to, like Jerry said, to really you know, grab hold of it and, and kind of relish in the sin, that's when you're probably getting into the mortal sin territory. Always, always keep in mind, too, what sin truly is, okay? It's a failure to love. So have you failed to love your brother, you know, to really try to understand? Uh, maybe he had a problem that you, you needed to address that the Lord put him in your, in your system, in your presence, you know, to, to handle that maybe you could correct him. Like, uh, not thinking about yourself and how he's offending, but what is it that he's reaching out for? What is Yes, go ahead. I'm listening to you, but I'm looking for something. Um, I know uh, we do have a problem with the slave war, but you know, in Philippians, uh, Jesus, who is God, emptied himself of his Godhead and took the form of a slave, it says in Philippians, and obedient even unto death, death on the cross. So God exalted him and um, he also, that's why we say, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what master that is, you know, he's our master, and I want to be his way. He's the master because he is love. He is, he is really love perfected. I think you're going yeah, to Kelly. Oh, okay. not more. Well, 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 well. We've got, I, I have here two different things. 
I'm hearing that we we are not supposed to participate in or condone the sins of others. Right. But also, sin is a failure to love. And so, when you have that couple, that's our that's our example, our cohabitating simple couple. Yeah. And they have their housewarming, and you bring a gift. That's a sin. So, where, where's the line? I mean, how can you show that couple that you love them? And this, and this, we know we love the children of God. If you love God and you keep His commandments. Yes, so you know. So can yeah. I say I'm not willing to give you guys a housewarming gift because I don't agree with what you're doing? But I love you very much, and I want to come visit you. If you love someone, and marital marriage uh, wedding gift, a premarital wedding gift, you can call it whatever you want as long as you follow the guidelines, right? Well, here's here's the point. Well, you can judge their action as sinful. Yes. Here's the point, right? If you really love someone, don't you want them to go to heaven rather than to have temporal happiness here on earth? Because that's so, eternal. So, so cutting my great Catholic self off from them is a gift. To, I mean, you know, like that no, means, no, you like, point it out to them. You have an obligation to point it out to them that so what they're doing is simple. I think this is wrong. Then you've right. done your duty. I mean, can you stop? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Like yes. Pre-marital wedding gift. Call it something else. Sin is primarily a sin that can work. Life is the holiness of God. Right. It may be a failure to love, but in that, it, 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 is, it is first an offense against God's holiness, which makes it a little easier to... to to deal with what you're saying. In other words, when we when we when we say when we put everything in terms of love, that's that, that's kind of playing into the hands of the secular PC crowd. Oh, you're mean and you're not nice and you don't love him and you don't love him. You're ugly. I mean, love has become such a trite word in this culture. It means almost nothing. So. I personally prefer to define sin in terms of an offense against the holiness or righteousness of God, which a failure to love is indeed. Um, but I, I think it, it, it defines it a little better, right? for me anyway. Yeah, you have to keep in mind that... Um, so, you know, I may love this couple who's, you know, shacking up, but um, I realize that what they're doing is an offense against God's righteousness, but I still love them. Y'all going too far out of context now? Keep it simple. <laughs> simple fact. I mean, That's it's simple. not that complicated to love. Well, in this case, there's a in this case there's a difference between what we hey, what we conceive as love in like in, in our normal everyday the way that we would talk about love, and what does love actually mean? That's the point that Gene is making, and that is that if you really love somebody, you don't want them to persist in sin because you don't want them to go to hell. Now, what you're talking about is you want to be friends with them, and you want to be able to make sure you know that they, that you make sure they know that you support them. And so, I think the the practical answer to your question is that no, you don't cut them off. You don't just say, "Oh, you're a sinner. I'm not going to talk to you," because we're all sinners. We would never talk to anybody, right? Uh, so, right. So, what you do is, when the opportunity arises, if it arises. Uh, you point out to them that you know what you're doing is sinful, and yes, we can judge that. We know that it's sinful, um, and you have an obligation to point that out to them, but you don't cut them off uh, because that's not going to help them. Perhaps by persisting in your friendship with them, you may over time uh, show them that there's a better way. For example, okay. So I mean, the way to spread the message of God is not like evangelicals and this, and we're going to do all kinds of you know this, that, or the other thing. The way is to live your life in such a way that people take notice and to speak about it when the opportunity arises. You can't force it. Now, what I'm talking about is a situation where you know they're having a housewarming, and to go would make it look like you support what they're doing. So you don't want to go. But Jesus was God, right? But we're supposed to emulate him. Yes. But in this case, what, what's, it, what's it going to? Yeah, what's it going to look like? If it's going to look like you're supporting what they're doing, this is why we couldn't attend as Catholics. We can't attend. You know, if there were uh, uh, homosexual people getting married, we couldn't attend that. That would be sinful to us, because it's we're complicit in their sin. We're making it look like this is an okay, normal sort of thing to do. Not attending the quote unquote marriage though is not the same as as not responding to an invitation of hospitality. Now, you would respond. You wouldn't just not show up. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, you would just not go. You're not going to make a. You're not going to make it into a big religious stand or a holy war. That's not what I'm talking about here. You just simply don't go because you don't want to show them that you're supporting something that's evil. Right? It's not that complicated. To, to be a guest in someone's home is not to sh just show support. Though, for, for what what now? For I'm talking about a very specific instance, and that is an instance where you're going to a housewarming party for this couple who has just moved in together to celebrate the fact that they are cohabitating. That's the circumstance I'm talking about. You're saying then, if they invite you to a housewarming party, you should send regrets. Right. But if they invite you to dinner next week. Yeah, then you might go. I think yes. Yes. Right. That's not what it sounded like you were saying. Okay. Yes. That, okay. I thought I had said housewarming party. I'm pretty sure I did. You can't say Okay. Right. Frankly, your attitude, excuse me, but your attitude was made it seem like they're living in such terrible sin that well, they are. good Catholics should not even associate with. Or, or no, we don't cast out, we don't cast out, yeah. <laughs> Part of my problem is that I, I can't answer any questions because there's too many questions going on at once. Okay. Thank you. Knock yourself out. Knock yourself out. <laughs>